And I will welcome everybody once again to the West Seattle Transportation Coalition's March membership, mem <laughs> March membership meeting. Um, if folks have any um, questions or concerns, um, please do share them with us um, shortly here. Hopefully you can see the slides on the window or in the window. And if anybody who does have the ability to talk can let me know if they can't see the slides. And we are just preparing to go live to Facebook as well. All right. So hopefully that is working since this is the first time we've tried to go live to Facebook. Oh, maybe not yet. All right. Um, tonight's agenda, we've got a somewhat packed agenda, uh, several great guests with us, um, but folks, uh, guests that folks should be familiar with. Um, we'll do a quick uh, bit of introductions and some business here at the start, including approving our previous meeting minutes. Um, we'll then turn to a conversation about West Seattle bus routes, um, talk about uh, are there possibilities of reimagining our network uh, here in the West Seattle area, you know, could there be frequent bus, more frequent buses, new routes, alternate transportation options? Um, we have with us um, a planner for Metro, as well as our uh, council, uh, King County Council member, Joe McDermott, uh, who I'm sure will remind us how tight budgeting is on the county side. Um, but we are aware that there's, uh, you know, there are some Seattle funds out there to purchase some more uh, hours specifically for West Seattle. And so we want to sort of talk, what are the realistic options for us looking ahead for the next year, year and a half as we start to uh, return to whatever a post-COVID normal looks like. Um, then uh, by about 7.30, we'll get underway with a conversation with the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, they, as you know, have been coming with a, here to be with us on a pretty monthly basis um, to talk about what's going on um, with the detours and uh, progress on mobility projects, uh, camera enforcement on the lower bridge, et cetera. We, we threw some pretty tough questions at them this month. Um, and so we'll be talking about some of their responses and hopefully give you guys a chance to ask some of your own questions. And then uh, time permitting as we move forward here, um, we're gonna have a brief conversation later uh, about uh, recruiting new board members, um, which is something that we talk about quite a bit, um, but we have some interested individuals right now. And so we wanna chat a little bit with folks about what you want the process to look like for bringing in new members. Um, we'll talk a couple of bits of, I threw them under old business, but it's really because they're things that the board has acted on in the last month and we wanna be open and transparent and let you know about that. Um, and then we'll talk very quickly about new business and uh, be underway with adjourning uh, by 8.30. If you are joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, this is the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. We are a peninsula-wide organization working to address transportation and commuting challenges for the nearly 100,000 people living and working on the West Seattle Peninsula. And we accomplish this by uh, securing the support of residents, uh, engaging elected officials at all levels, as you'll see in fact tonight, um, partnering with government agencies to try and achieve the best outcomes for the peninsula, again, as you'll see a pretty good example of tonight, um, as well as engaging with businesses, community organizations, neighbor groups, neighborhood groups, and others. Um, sometimes uh, we get involved in education and collecting feedback. Um, you'll see some more of that this year as well. Um, our goals are affordable and equitable transportation options, particularly in historically underserved neighborhoods, a transportation network that moves people and goods in an environmentally sustainable manner, and investing in transportation infrastructure to match Seattle's growth. Um, our specific priorities in 2021 include restoring capacity in the West Seattle Bridge Transportation Corridor, 
continuing to advocate for funding maximum mobility while the high bridge is closed. Again, you'll, you'll see us doing that tonight. Um, continuing to support Sound Transit 3 in their light rail planning, and we're hoping to have them back at here in April or May, I think. Um, and then uh, continuing to monitor the Delridge Way and Rapid Ride Age multimodal project progress. Uh, let me uh, toss it over to my co-host this evening and fellow board member. I'll let her introduce herself and uh, give you a quick rundown on Zoom. Kate? Hello, I'm Kate Wells, and I'll be giving Michael a little break now and then when we go to q and I'll moderate the questions. And there are a couple different ways you can ask your question. You can either um, type a question in the chat and I can read it for you, or you can raise your hand if you would like to ask your question yourself. And another option is if you just wanna drop in the chat that you have a question, I will just try to keep track of who asked their question or raised their hand first and um, let you ask your question yourself that way too. So back to you, Michael. All right, thank you. And uh, I'm Michael Taylor Judd. I am the chair of the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. And we're really glad you could be here with us tonight. Um, we are not going to spend time asking everybody who's participating to introduce themselves, um, but we will direct you to the chat window, which I'll open here in just a moment. We ask folks to, you know, go ahead, share with us your name, uh, you know, if you want to share pronouns or any access needs you have this evening, um, what neighborhood you live or work in, <clears throat> um, and our fun check-in question for this month, um, what's the first business that you're excited to support um, once we reopen Washington. So not necessarily things you've been able to continue to do, but some of those things that you're like, oh my God, it's been a year and I cannot wait to go and do this thing again that, I, that I've been waiting. Um, and if you're not, if you didn't receive a reminder about this meeting and you're not currently on our email list, um, please uh, look at sending a private chat message to John Wright, who's one of our fellow board members, and he will um, get you added to do that. All right, um, folks should be able to use the chat window. I will keep us moving. Um, very quick bit of board business here. Um, if you do wanna see what's been happening at our meetings uh, all of the past year, we have been recording them and uploading them to YouTube. We currently have this very uh, ugly, long uh, web address. Um, for those who aren't familiar with YouTube, uh, as you acquire more subscribers, um, you can uh, get a, a shortened URL. So we do encourage folks, we don't post tons of videos and things all that often. So if you do go there, please do click subscribe um, and, uh, and check the bell to be notified. Um, the more folks we get over there, eventually we can hopefully have a much shorter name. Uh, we do have minutes <coughs> for last, uh, last month's meeting, which were circulated to the board. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve. I move that we approve move the we... meeting minutes from February, 2021. This Thank is you. Deb Barker. Second. All right, and a second from Mark Jacobs. All right, all, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Well, I'm aye as well. Um, any abstaining? All right, the minutes are approved. Um, <clears throat> let's turn to our conversation about West Seattle bus routes. Um, again, guests this evening, we have uh, Joe McTermott, who's um, our local King County Council member, as well as currently the vice chair of the King County Council. Uh, I believe he is going to speak first um, for a few minutes, and then we will uh, tag Graydon Newman in, uh, who is a Seattle and Shoreline Service Planning Lead with King County Metro. Um, if you're interested in learning more about King County Metro's planning, um, that is their planning and projects page. Um, and so you can go to that address to check things out. Um, Joe, uh, let's turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, pleasure to be here with you tonight um, and be able to talk about what um, Metro transit planning, um, the needs and desires of um, the West Seattle Transportation Coalition and West Seattle as a whole, the peninsula as a whole. Um, but for a minute, let's kind of um, reflect on our last year. And as I was um, thinking about it this afternoon and 
reflecting our, in our year of tr transportation, I found a video that I actually made a year ago this week, I think, um, that I'd love to share with you. So I'm gonna share my screen and pick the right one. Here, I think I'm gonna do that to get exactly the media player. Somebody nod, Mike, Michael nod. Deborah's, Deb's given me a thumbs up. By the way, up. go Gonzaga. Exactly. That was just a subtle way to work in the tournament. Actually, it's accidental. Also, take a look at my desk. I'll, my home office, when I've been working here for a week, was a mess. I trust, you, you'll have to trust me that it's a lot more picked up, but it's actually the content of the video we're going here. Just a sec. Like so many people throughout the region, I got the volume. Last several weeks. In fact, this is what my commute looked like this morning. However, usually I'm on the 56 or 57 from my neighborhood to the courthouse in downtown Seattle. I know that many metro drivers, operators, mechanics, custodial teams, and frontline staff are still delivering vital transit services to the people who need it most in the middle of a global pandemic. I wanted to give you a big shout out and appreciation for all of your work and let you know how much I appreciate it and the region appreciates it. Thank you so much, Metro. All right. Um, and I don't know what, Deb, I think you're monitoring the volume. Um, in our last year, we've dealt with a global pandemic um, where we've all social distanced, We've worked from home and then we all know that um, a year ago this week, um, our lifeline to the rest of the world was um, closed. Um, and for good reason, for, for everyone's safety, but a um, great challenge to those of us here. Um, I think it was at your first virtual meeting in, into the pandemic, you know, I used the line that it was, um, tough for us, but imagine how hard it would be for all everybody else who can't get to West Seattle. At least we get to be in West Seattle. A year later, it's maybe not quite so funny when we're still dealing with um, heading down West Marginal Way or, or winding down Highland Park to be able to leave West Seattle. I was making a brief appearance at a rare in-person event midday today and couldn't believe how long midday it took me to get back into West Seattle. Um, we've had a lot to deal with and um, continue to plan around COVID um, and people increasing their ridership as we immunize more and more people around the county and the region um, and also come back from the, the pandemic, um, but always still needing to work around the bridge. Um, I suspect that when we're fully out of the pandemic, which will still be many months, um, not in the short, not what I would consider short term. Um, Seattle, West Seattle's transit share will be significantly higher um, because of the, the bridge implications. Um, and so I'm glad to be able to be here to talk to you maybe about some of the short medium term impacts, but also as, as your leadership framed the conversation tonight, really some bigger thinking about um, bus routes and structures um, and um, how the council does that, how's the county do that, and um, where to go with all this. And it's essential that we have Metro here tonight. I'm really glad that Graydon and, um, is um, presenting with me and here with us tonight um, because the council doesn't get into specific route planning, um, frequency of a particular route or um, exactly where a particular route is driving around. <coughs> because think about it, as one of um, nine council members, if I wanted more service on the C line or on the 55, I'd have to be getting the support of four other council members to do that. Um, and it wasn't benefiting their districts. It'd be on me to be able to get service to their districts. The council on a policy level has really worked on adopting um, framework documents and planning guidelines for how um, service is allocated. And then it's really um, uh, the front left to Metro to operate, operationalize, 
operationalize that work. Um, and so um, while we have a service revision um, before us now for, for what will be the September service changes, um, that's already been transmitted to council. In fact, we, have, we had our first hearing on it in committee yesterday. Um, but that rarely has um, any kind of significant changes by council um, adopted because of the political reality of what, what that would be like. Um, frankly, the horse trading for bus routes. That wouldn't be a, a um, pretty way to do it, nor a very just way to um, allocate service. So the council adopts those policy frameworks and then um, really asks Metro to operationalize and plan how, how we might expect this to happen. Um, and so while maybe not geared toward the September service changes, I think the conversation you in, invite uh, me and Metro to tonight is valuable and timely to be able to talk about how to provide the best service for West Seattle um, with the bridge impact, beyond the bridge impact. Um, where do we see service increasing? Where do you, what routes might we want to restructure? And to talk with you about how to best have input in doing that. Um, so I, I'm keeping it short tonight to turn it over to Graydon and then really have a conversation with you about um, what you see as the needs and desires um, for West Seattle in transit service. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member McDermott. Um, Graydon, um, I guess you're up. Uh, did you have some, you had some slides that you were gonna share, correct? I did, I did, and I'll-, I'll uh, you Be able to grab the screen? I believe I can, yes. Um, and first, I just want to thank everyone for um, for making time for a, a transit conversation. It is uh, my favorite topic, so I'm happy to talk more about it um, tonight. And I uh, first wanted to say that you know I'm primarily here to listen to the thoughts that this group has and um, and the ideas that uh, that y'all might have and, and particularly the needs um, that, that you're seeing in your communities. Um, I'm gonna go through a fairly quick presentation just to, uh, just to ground us in um, what's, what service changes have happened to date over the last few service changes. Um, there's been a lot of activity around the county, both, uh, both in, in changes in service and also changes in ridership. So that has been, uh, has kept us very busy um, and uh, also wanted to uh, leave uh, the bulk of the time really to um, listen to your thoughts. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer those as well. Um, so I, I'll start off with, uh, with talking about what is um, one of the most significant pieces of, of uh, service change that's gonna, that is uh, uh, planned for or in, in the final stages of planning for this September and that's uh, service restoration. So there's quite a bit of service that is currently uh, either fully suspended throughout the county or partially suspended. So there's these temporary changes that I'll go into in a, in a moment. Um, and uh, we are uh, undertaking a, a, a big effort to um, restore some of those services and, um, and I'll describe a bit more how that process is playing out. But, um, as Councilmember McDermott mentioned, uh, the last year has been, uh, or over a year at this point, has been a significant uh, change here. And the ridership on Metro system has, you can see by the graph up here, has taken a um, significant uh, hit as folks were uh, sheltering in place, um, as well as social distancing, um, which has resulted in, in load limits on our buses to support that and, uh, and a healthy environment on the bus. But it has been a, a major response by, by Metro on not just changes to service, um, but also how we deliver service. So our, um, our uh, practices and what we're asking riders to do, um, our cleaning practices, um, how many folks we uh, permit on buses at a given time. Um, and so that has all been new for our customers, all been a big adjustment and all something that has had an impact on um, on how we are adding service as well in some areas in the county, including in West Seattle, 
um, because of the these practices of uh, of load limits to ensure our safety, also mean that we can carry fewer people. So that has had an impact on on our planning as well. Um, and so this is this is a very big slide, but this I'll try to just uh, distill it down to. Um, during COVID, we've had a number of different kinds of ways we've changed service. Um, many of them are temporary. So there's there's two buckets of changes. There's temporary changes where we made suspensions to service due to COVID um, and uh, due to ridership, due to um, uh, operator availability, due to a whole host of factors, uh, you know, revenue as well. Um, and we've also temporarily added service where we've seen crowding. Uh, and in addition to that, we've also made some partial restorations or full restorations of routes from uh, from there from when they were suspended um, throughout the past um, since really um, uh, starting in March of last year through uh, through September through March of this year. Um, so we have two major service changes per year: one in March, one in September, and those are when big service changes are implemented. Um, we do have the ability to add service uh, uh, in between those periods, but it's it's uh, more tactical and limited and focused on uh, on responding to issues as we see them arise, things like crowding, for instance. And then there's a second piece of, of changes that we've made during COVID, and those are permanent changes to service. Um, those are uh, things like service restructures uh, that, you know, we had uh, one that we recently imp implemented in South King County prior to that in East King County. And as a council member mentioned, uh, we have been working uh, on a service restructure in North King County to um, integrate with the extension of Link Light Rail. And uh, in addition to those changes in service that are structures of routes and service levels, um, we've also, uh, had to uh, make adjustments in service levels to respond to uh, uh, a uh, less funding available from the city of Seattle through uh, their C Seattle Transportation Benefit District. So uh, the uh, Seattle voters approved uh, a new levy in November, um, but it, uh, the funding levels are, are uh, significantly less than the measure that expires. That's a whole nother, you know, I-976, that's a big can of worms. But um, the outcome is that in order to uh, match revenue levels that under this new levy, um, Metro has had to work with SDOT to identify service reductions uh, system-wide throughout the city um, to get to that uh, get to that funding level that is sustainable with the new levy. And this is also a, uh, a lot here, but it's been a, uh, even uh, without COVID, we've, we've uh, in the service changes associated with that, there've been major changes to the system. So um, just at a very high level, each of these service changes, we've restored service, uh, we've suspended some additional service um, or uh, reduced those suspensions. Um, and we are implementing uh, over uh, this past year, this current year and the coming year, some major system changes that are, um, you know, some of the biggest Metro has ever done. Um, so it does place a, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, change on the system, which, you know, does require a lot of work to, to steer this, you know, big organization. And where we are now, uh, I wanted to just throw a map up on the screen so that folks can see um, where all day service is suspended. Um, there are other, there are routes that are, are peak only routes as well that are suspended, not uh, fully suspended um, throughout the network. Um, and this is the um, network of all day service. So you'll see uh, in West Seattle, um, there are some that have uh, uh, service suspensions, which you'll see uh, here, uh, the 22 that some of you uh, may be familiar with. Um, there are also service uh, reductions implemented on some of these routes in response to that, uh, that differing fund, that reduced funding level uh, that uh, was formerly provided by the city of Seattle and kind of right sizing it to the current levy measure. And you know, as far as uh, West Seattle uh, during this time and uh, and the system uh, generally, uh, we are operating at about 85% of, um, of pre-COVID service levels um, as of this uh, current service change, uh, which was just implemented this, started this weekend. This is the first week of the March service change. 
um, and several routes in, uh, or at least two of the routes in um, uh, the metro system are in the top 10% of ridership. And those are uh, uh, the Sea Lion and Route 120, both carry a, a lot of people um, over formerly the high bridge and now carry, um, still carry a good amount of people over the Spokane Street Bridge. And so I mentioned a little bit about these temporary service changes, service restorations, and one of the uh, 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 big changes that is coming for uh, coming in September um, is uh, our service restoration. So that service that is currently suspended, and um, some of that service, but not all, will be brought back in September. And we've undertaken a planning process that has kind of two components. One is looking at, uh, is on the data side and the analysis side. And that's looking at who are these routes serving? Are they serving uh, priority populations in, in our sort of language, which is uh, folks that are low income, uh, people of color, people with disabilities, um, people who's with ling language that isn't their first, or English is not their first language, um, and immigrants and refugees. Um, and uh, as well as uh, demand indicators that we have. So talking with major employers in the area, uh, what are their plans for, for returning? Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around this, but we're doing our best to get our arms around that. Um, as well as uh, how is ridership already coming back? Are we already seeing under these load limits, which do, uh, which, uh, do restrict, about, uh, restrict how many people can board the bus, um, how much crowding is there and, and responding to that crowding where we see it. Um, and, and as well uh, as the data and analysis side, we also have, um, a, uh, have undertaken um, a community engagement piece that is looking at this whole network wide, um, uh, putting out a writer survey to try to get some feedback from our writers. Um, and as well as that, uh, talking with um, folks uh, throughout the county um, uh, that have been engaged in, uh, in service planning efforts over the last couple of years to really leverage the knowledge that they've gained through that in order to help us vet our priorities in this and, and vet uh, our approach to it. Um, and in addition to that, we've engaged uh, a number of uh, uh, stakeholders and, and, and met with, with, uh, with many folks um, and really centering on um, historically underserved communities and, and, and groups that are, uh, can be difficult to reach for big agencies like us. And, and we're trying to do a much better job about that. And so centering that stakeholder engagement with that in mind. And I basically just went over that. But I'll talk a little bit about, about the uh, Metro service response in West Seattle. Um, I wanted to speak specifically to that. Um, uh, this being the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. So uh, there was uh, a, a, a number of actions that we took uh, really early on. So um, September of last year, uh, folks, if they, uh, if they are, you know, 21 Express or 55, 56, 57 writers, those in Admiral uh, may remember that uh, when COVID hit, we, we uh, suspended, fully suspended those routes, um, like many peak routes. Uh, throughout the network and many peak routes remain suspended um, and made a, a number of adjustments in September, uh, including uh, uh, right sizing some of the uh, service expenditure to match the revenue that's coming in from the city of Seattle. Um, and uh, in September, we proactively restored um, these peak routes operating in West Seattle, the 21 Express, 55, 56, 57, um, before any other routes uh, were, were restored. So this was a, an action that was taken specifically to mitigate the bridge closure. Um, and uh, that was a, an initial action there. Um, and then in, in March of, uh, of this year, um, we've also added service on uh, the Route 50, um, the Route 60 uh, operating in the, in the south end here and crossing, um, crossing the Duwamish further south. Uh, and then the 128, which actually doesn't cross a bridge, but, uh, but serves uh, many places in West Seattle. Um, and these were in response to um, some persistent crowding we were seeing above these COVID, COVID load limits. Um, and uh, oftentimes in the midday, which is something that we've observed system-wide that, that while demand during the peak periods is definitely uh, decreased significantly, 
Um, some areas in the midday and then uh, and in the uh, afternoon and early evening has has still remained a bit stronger than it had than it than we would uh, than it had in the a.m. Uh, commute times. Um, and we also made other service increases on routes that were over those load limits. So looking forward to what we're planning for in September, um, this will be uh, uh, some uh, for specifically West Seattle, some new, uh, we're looking forward to implementing some new Seattle funded service investments that are made possible by the, the new levy uh, uh, passed by voters or yeah, uh, vote, voted on by voters uh, this past November. Um, and that we are, we are really excited uh, to be able to do and are working with the city on, on that effort. Um, and that will be a big boon for the peninsula. Um, we are also planning for service restorations, as I mentioned, and that includes consideration of restorations on uh, routes that are currently suspended system-wide, um, whether those are full route suspensions or partial suspensions, so where we've suspended some trips but not the full route, um, and that includes uh, routes uh, located in West Seattle, um, and we will uh, unfortunately need to continue also with um, some system-wide uh, service changes to adjust to this lower revenue of the, the Seattle Transportation Benefit District levy. Um, and this will be the, the final round of that. And this is a, a citywide uh, planning effort. Um, and then we will also uh, uh, we will also be maintaining some service suspensions in response to COVID. So we'll be restoring some, but not all of those services. Um, and some other activities that we've been uh, uh, working with partners on as well are uh, uh, partnering with, with the city also to support um, some transportation demand management. So to try to reduce uh, single occupant vehicles and provide some incentives there to reduce traffic um, as well as uh, doing a, a van pool promotion um, and offering two, for, two months free. Um, and that still has a little bit of time left in it if anybody's looking to establish a van pool. I know that, that travel patterns are a bit uncertain right now. So um, that, uh, that has been some of the specific actions we've, we've taken. And, um, and at this point, I really, uh, I think, wanted to um, open it up to if people had immediate questions and also uh, just open it up to, to the discussion um, and any, uh, any thoughts. And I just am here to listen at this point, listen and answer any questions. Hey, well, thank you very much, Graydon. Um, I'll give folks a chance to uh, drop questions in the chat window um, or raise their hands and uh, Kate can get ready to uh, take that over. Um, but I'll just set the stage. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll raise two issues that we've been raising for, for uh, a few years now, um, but because we keep hearing this feedback from our stakeholders, um, and that's, um, you know, we do have some areas of West Seattle that really are underserved by our, ne our, our transit network. Um, and that's a bit of a concern right now as we're trying to get more people to not be driving around on cars, even within West Seattle since the, the detour routes have higher traffic. Um, and that's uh, Arbor Heights. Um, and that's uh, also the, the northern end of the Admiral neighborhood. Um, so north of uh, actually Admiral Way. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, we, we've been very interested for quite some time in sort of how, how do we work with Metro? Like, how do we work proactively from our side? Metro occasionally does some planning, goes out to communities to get feedback, planners lay out lines, uh, you know, on maps and then come and say, hey, we did this, what do you think of it? Um, we're looking to sort of flip that, you know? What ideas can we generate, give to you guys, and then you go off and do something with us and tell us what you, what you think you could or couldn't do with it. Um, and, and we would really love, you know, we've got a lot of folks who are really interested in these issues. We would love to, you know, if we can help with the next round of, you know, outreach when you start planning the next service change, um, you know, we want to know, like, what can we do to actually create a new route? Or if we have routes that maybe are low ridership and really should go away, like are there ways that we can repurpose existing bus service hours, you know, in a budget neutral way that would actually get us better service and more support from the community. And so those are the kinds of ideas that I want to sort of 
set the table there and let you and the council member know. And then uh, hopefully we've got some questions coming in. All right, I've got one for sure. And um, yep, they're starting to come in. So um, from Victoria, the city can't continue to advocate for individuals to take public transportation while at the same time cut or reduce bus service. Residents must be able to know that public transportation is going to be available in order to make long term plans. And we understand that the funding has been affected, but it can't fall on the public in abrupt ways between the bridge and cut bus service has introduced real concerns about planning one's transportation needs. So what can you say to that one? Yeah, I mean, I certainly hear, hear that concern and you know, having uh, more service is, is something I am always gonna be in favor of. Um, I think a couple of things I, I would um, speak to speak to that specific question and comment is um, one that, you know, there is a lot of capacity and a, and a good amount of frequency on some of the lines already. So I, I don't want to lose sight of the, there is good service in, in West Seattle there. There's always, and I, I don't want to, I definitely am not uh, saying that service is perfect and that more service would not be better and more people wouldn't write if there's more service, but um, did want to, you know, a number of, of frequent lines out there that that are still frequent despite these uh, the reductions that that she's referring to, um, and it's it's to say that uh, those are unfortunate reductions, but there is still um, still frequent service on the peninsula that uh, that still provides a lot of capacity and available capacity. So it's not, you know, even even prior to COVID, um, you know, we we uh, we. You know, I don't think during a period ever saw more than you know 50% of the total capacity of, of people carrying capacity um, being used. So there's there's a there's definitely I wanted just 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 to note that, but also to really say I hear that uh, I hear the um, the the comment on volatility of the funding um, being a real concern, and it's something that impacts you know. Uh, I'll say even personally, not only does it impact me as a writer, service change to service change, it impacts me uh, in the work that I do because we're um, we're constantly trying to manage a system with a budget that does uh, that does change just by nature of our funding source. So we're we're very re reliant on sales tax, um, and uh, and so that does uh, contribute some inherent volatility. And while we're um, uh, very uh, you know while the uh, Seattle Transportation Benefit District provides, you know, great opportunities to improve mobility um, in the city um, and in and adjacent areas. Um, it, it is one of those uh, those funding sources that does have an expiration date, does need to be renewed, um, and so there is some inherent volatility in uh, in that measure as well. So uh, there are solutions that that uh, that exist outside of um, you know our current revenue sources, but um, but just um, recognizing that that is a challenge and, um, and I, I definitely hear that. Okay. Um, one question I hear from the community is if bus stops such as those on the 37 route are marked as closed, are people allowed to park in those areas while the stop is closed? Or is it always reserved for buses until the route is formally killed by Metro? I wouldn't use the verb killed, but I understand. I understand the point. Um, that I believe I would need to go back and check. That's not in quite my area of expertise, but I believe that parking is still restricted at those at those uh, uh, stop locations. Um, they that's also I, I believe uh, um, uh, in addition to something we might want to talk to the city about. That might be a long the long term decision on that if a route is um, is deleted. That um, would be a, a decision that. Seattle, you know, SDOT would need to look into, but I think the short answer is, I don't believe so, that the, I don't believe those are available for parking. And it was Deb Barker who posted that question. Deb, anecdotally, I would warn you against parking in um, <laughs> those bus stops because I run Alki and um, have seen people ticketed. Um, and I'll admit to my surprise as I run by and realize there's a ticket for somebody parked in a bus stop, but I assume that's what the ticket is for. Um, and I'm looking at the yellow close sign um, padlocks mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Um, do, do you remember though, the other side of the street, the same bus stops are open 
because they're the water taxi shuttle stops. And this is just for the 37 or the those closed bus stops for one route only, but yeah. thank you. I'll share that with the neighbors. <laughs> Kate? Yes. I have some comments. Um, yeah, there's good bus service to West Seattle. If you live near the sea line or other route that's well served, but if you're in the north end or uh, along other areas of this West Seattle, you don't have good service. Yes, you opened up the 56, 57 for peak hour service, but I think this fall is when things start opening up that we're gonna need those services back. And it's kind of frustrating, you know, before everybody said, well, you're a choice rider you can just drive and that was probably true but we don't have that choice anymore it's uh, without the west seattle bridge there we need to have an alternative being provided midday and it doesn't necessarily have to be all the time but we need some midday bus service in northeast west seattle and other parts of west seattle that aren't near the sea line because you can't just drive down to the junction and park and take the sea line anywhere because they have restricted parking so in a sense you know, if you want us to use the sea line, provide us a way to get there, which isn't, you know, driving is an option that doesn't work because the, the city's restricted all the parking. So I guess it, where you are in West Seattle depends on whether you have good service or not. And what I'm saying is that with the bridge out, areas that didn't have midday service and other services need to have that service uh, reinstituted reinstitu in the fall when things open up. No thank you. I, pre I was just thank you for your, for your for your comment there. Um, there's yeah, it, it is it is does depend on where you live about what kind of service you're going to have. And there are you know if you're if you're living in uh, you know the northern part uh, of Admiral, uh, there are there are some options, but um, you know they're not going to be as frequent uh, as the as the sea line during the midday. You have the uh, 128 and the 50 both operating. Um, down well, California, not really viable there. for a lot of people because of the time can they, they take a lot of time and you force a transfer. I'm talking about the 56, 57 that gets you to downtown directly. Uh, the 50, I mean, those are very time consuming routes. Yeah, I, I, I hear, I, I definitely hear that concern. And you know, I, I, I'm okay without midday service. If the bridge was available, because then, then the ar argument is, is your choice rider? Well, because the Seattle Department of Transportation didn't uh, maintain the bridge and it's going to take forever to fix it, we need to have an alternative. They keep talking about mitigation. Well, step to the plate, SDOT, Metro, step to the plate. Graydon, did you have anything yeah. to finish up? No, with? okay. No, I didn't. Yeah, nothing. Okay. Nothing to add on that one. No. Okay. Um, I do have a question here. Are you able to respond to Michael's offer? I assume that means us um, giving you possible route ideas and and flipping the the order of things there. Well, yeah, well, uh, we, we'd love to help host a workshop at some point in the next year too. Yeah, I I. I uh, Maybe I'll I'll back up a little bit to how um, you know using an example about how we typically approach um, and I, I don't want to say typically as in this is just something that's set in stone it's an evolving process but um, uh, as we go to you know anytime we contemplate a, a restructure of routes um, uh, we we definitely are focusing on. Um, uh, on en engaging the the whole community, so I think one thing I, I want to. I uh, also make sure is make sure to communicate too is that anytime we're going to restructure service in an area, um, you know, we're looking at for it to be a, a community like big community process, like not you know trying to engage stakeholders um, like yourselves, which are, would bring you know which are going to bring some great ideas, but also uh, bring in um, the preferences and uh, and the stakeholders and the viewpoints of other folks in the community. So, you know, one thing that um, that we would need to do if we were going to going to restructure, you know, service in area is to make sure that that, that sort of community wide process is in place. So I am uh, certainly open to um, to hearing uh, thoughts that that the group has, um, and uh, and you know, 
certainly that that uh, I'm open to any good idea. Um, and uh, but do want to kind of qualify, do want to manage expectations on our ability to act directly off of that um, without a broader community process. So uh, I guess that I, I wanted to respond by saying, yes, I am interested in the thoughts that this group has, uh, but uh, any kind of major service change to route would need to, um, uh, need to accompany a broader community process. And I think um, partnering and inviting the Westdale Transportation Coalition to turn people out um, to a listening session to that community engagement work would be a fantastic way to do it. You guys are building um, the network and um, reputation in West Seattle of being transportation involved. Um, and I want to reflect on how unique having a conversation with a neighborhood community of any size about new, newly designed bus routes is because when we do have a public hearing on service um, changes on bus routes, there are people lined up to defend their current route and to oppose any newly created route because no one is riding that new route yet. There's nobody to say, that's my bus route, don't cut it. I know it and I like it. Everybody who, already, who is already on a route doesn't wanna lose their route. People don't, people don't make that shift to think about what the improvement might be. Um, and there's no champion for the route that hasn't driven the streets yet. And so the fact that you're inviting us to a conversation, a bigger conversation about where might we put routes that they aren't now? How could we do something new? Um, and let's maybe champion that, I'm hearing you say, um, is a new and exciting way to have a conversation because so often people are just defensive um, in wanting to maintain their own route. Yes, thank you. And, and to provide some history for folks, um, you know, the Route 50, part of the reason the Route 50 is running through uh, West Seattle along the route that it is, uh, while the idea originally came from Metro planners, um, the, the North Delridge neighborhood group and, and folks championed that, helped to get it on Genesee, helped to lobby the Seattle City Council in order to get funding for uh, the, uh, the traffic signal that's at the top of Genesee because part of the, the feedback that Metro planners provided us was that the only way they were going to be able to run a bus route there was if there was a controlled signal at that intersection. So we did the legwork to do that so that Metro could bring that route in. And then also for history, uh, while there were some other negative effects that came down the road afterwards, um, we also, it was folks in the Delridge neighborhood um, where there's a bit of a food desert, or at least there was at the time, um, lobbied for the change to the Route 120, which took it from its existing route and made it slightly kink over to Westwood Village providing access for a whole lot of uh, equity needs for people to get to a grocery store, get to all sorts of other stores and restaurants that are right there in their neighborhood. But for a lot of people, they had no way to get there. That, that is a great point. And I, 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 uh, I think it, it does show, uh, you know, plan, if you ask a, a one planner on a given day, they're gonna have plenty of ideas. Planners have no shortage of ideas, but that is uh, definitely only one side of it's only one part of the solution and you're outlining i think some great examples where um where you know service concepts route concepts they uh they become reality not out of planners minds but of, out, out of a partnership with community and that's that is for that is a something that we are living in right now in uh our, in the recent service changes that we're proposing um, and something that, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think, I think Joe said it much better than, uh, than I, uh, that I did, but that it is, it is something that, um, you know, any kind of service change here, that would be a, a major asset to have a, a, a community group like yourselves um, engaged in the process and, and something we would, we would actively seek to do. So how long could we expect to wait 
between when we initiated a process and when we got a bus route? Good question. Um, it depends on the size of the change. If it's a new bus route, that would typically uh, be a more significant process, so a larger process. Um, for a sense of scale, uh, the current project that is before a uh, proposal that's before council, uh, the project that Councilor McDermott mentioned, um, it's, I believe began its first part of public outreach pre-pandemic at the end of 2019 and will be implemented in uh, this September 2021. So it's a right about between implementation and beginning of the process, right about two years. Okay. Um, that's fine. That, what we have talked about a lot over the years is how good the service is if you're going north south and to downtown, but how difficult the service is if you're trying to get around the peninsula or if you're trying to get anywhere else. While we like the 50, if I want to get down to Seward Park, it's more than an hour each way on the 50. And I've got to walk half a mile from the stop on Mountain Luther King. I can drive that in 20 minutes. So the discrepancy between timing, or maybe 25, but the discrepancy in timing between what it takes to get by bus where I want to go and by car is significant. Uh, it's kind of the same way on the peninsula. You can't get east west really. Um, a, an entrepreneur came to us a, uh, a year and a half ago and said, How about a, a business shuttle that runs between the major business centers on the peninsula, between Morgan, Alaska, and, the, and uh, Admiral? And we suggested he talk with, with Metro and haven't heard since, but I'm wondering if Metro would be willing to take the initiative itself and deal with business owners and say, hey, what do you need in order to come back from the pandemic? Can we help? Are there, are there instances where Metro will take that initiative? I think, um, you know, we are actively working with employers to determine um, you know, particularly major employers to determine needs for major employment centers. To be honest, I mean, employment and where people are traveling, that drives where service is placed, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, if, we're, if we're thinking about connecting um, major centers, that's what transit is built to do. So for instance, you know, between Morgan, Admiral and Alaska, there's not necessarily one route that's hitting uh, that's hitting all three with frequent service, but each segment you're going to have, you know, pretty frequent service combined between those two. They do kind of tee up at, at Alaska Junction, but um, in instances where uh, there is um, a specific organizations interested in, uh, in, you know, specific routes, that is largely a, um, uh, you know, it, to the extent, I guess, that it's a, it's a need that is different than the general public need. We're limited in, in what we would, um, what we would financially, you know, and, and, and to be responsible to taxpayers, what we would need to be able to, what we'd be able to do. Um, but to the extent that it's, it's serving these centers and supporting businesses that are there and providing them with service. I mean, I think that's, that is definitely what we're interested in doing, um, connecting people with where they want to go and, um, and, that is, it, it's certainly something that uh, that we endeavor to do in our route network today. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Well, we're at uh, seven thirty. Can which I, I feel bad because there are some really great questions and comments there in the chat window. Yes. Um, <laughs> so if, if Graydon doesn't mind, I might take those and, and send them to you in an email just to to do some follow up response for us later. I will do my best. Yes, please do send them. All right. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We hope that we can uh, maybe work with you and your colleagues a little bit more over, it sounds like it could be two years, <laughs> but we would certainly love uh, to, to work with you guys. So let us know what's possible. Thank you. And I appreciate the, the time on this. Uh, it's a pleasure talking with you, talking with everyone. And uh, Council Member McDermott, thank you very much for your support. My pleasure. You could, I bet we could be doing it without Graydon. Thank you. Thanks. That's true. All right. Um, let us, let me keep us moving.
Um, hopefully, Michael, can you, Michael, yeah. can you highlight the survey? Uh, uh, I will get to that. Uh, okay. I, I quickly, I quickly edited our presentation. Um, can folks see the presentation slides again? I can't. Uh, no. No. All right. Let me try that again then. Um, All right, hopefully yeah. now you can see. All right, so moving along then. Um, ugh, sorry about that. Moving along. Uh, our next up on the agenda is our regular conversation with the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, joining us this evening um, are our usual guests, uh, Heather Marks, Director of Downtown Mobility. Um, and uh, she may be backed up by Madison Lincolnmeyer, who's the communications lead over there. Um, do you got, hopefully you guys are able to unmute yourselves. <laughs> and then I believe Madison, you said that uh, you had some slides that you needed to share off the top first. Yeah, we've got, I think four-ish slides. And I, if you can let me screen share, I'll do that quick. You should be able to grab. Just a couple of slides, Michael. Oh, that's fine. Heather, do you have an opening video? Um, I do, Joe, but I decided uh, after reviewing it again that- You weren't wearing the Gonzaga sweatshirt and so it wasn't gonna work? No, no. Yeah, 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 I- uh, A pity. Yeah, it is a pity. It is a pity. I, I clearly need a Gonzaga sweatshirt. I'll, I'll look into that. I can stack it on top of all my duck sweatshirts. <laughs> my ducks are doing pretty well too. Yeah. Still having trouble here. And so are the uh -oh. beavers. Strangely enough, did you know, <laughs> while Madison finds our slides, did you know that the Oregon Ducks, or at the time the Webfoots, won the yeah. very first NCAA basketball championship? Try it now, Madison with a team that was called the Tall Furs. Ah. Just a little you know, Oregon trivia for you there. Did you know that their uh, radio station is called KWAX, but if you're an announcer on KWAX, you cannot say this is Quax, the voice of the University of Oregon Ducks? Yes, <laughs> I did. I was born in Eugene. Ah, I my, was an my announcer parents. on Quax. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I knew I liked you some reason, Marty. <laughs> okay, um, just uh, really quick, and then I, I know you guys have some juicy questions that we wanna get through. So um, we just wanna give you the, the, the latest on the high and low bridge rehabilitation and um, our low bridge access next steps. Um, and thank you so much, Madison, as usual, for being here and taking notes and running me through the slides. And in fact, putting together these slides like an hour ago. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have reached the 30% design milestone, which uh, is a significant place for us to be, uh, for any, any project to be. We are on track for rehabilitation, and we are keeping pace with our aggressive schedule. We started the selection, contractor selection process on March 10th, and we expect to have proposals back on April 12th. Uh, we've completed an in internal baseline schedule and it is consistent with the broad schedule that we've been sharing with the public. As we get further into the design process, we will be um, in a position to give you a more finely grained schedule. We have uh, an official cost estimate for the high and low bridge projects as well as for the entire program. And last week we submitted uh, to the United States Department of Transportation our infra grant proposal. We expect to hear back from them um, in the next uh, month or so. Um, and that grant request for, was for $21 million. So we are out uh, continuing to seek um, partnership funding for the bridge repairs. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a schedule that we have been sharing since uh, since we decided pretty much that we were gonna repair the bridge. We expect to have the high bridge structural rehabilitation finished by mid next year. Um, this is not a situation where we're gonna to drop tools and open up the bridge for everyone to 
uh, used, we're gonna, over a few days and weeks, we're gonna open it up slowly to make sure that the repair is uh, performing as we expect. So I just, I don't, I don't want any, everybody to get too excited. Um, we'll, we'll be uh, developing a process for that uh, in the next several months and be sharing that with the public. We also have to do some structural rehabilitation on the low bridge. Um, that is much less um, uh, invasive to the, to the bridge. Um, but since we're gonna be focusing most of our attention on the high bridge, that low bridge uh, structural rehabilitation isn't going to be finished until Q3. Next slide, please. Um, uh, as we have uh, moved through the process of trying to open up access on the low bridge, I, I don't have to remind you that the high bridge carried 100,000 trips a day. The low bridge is capable of carrying about 20,000 trips a day. So it's not a situation where we're gonna be able to open up the low bridge for just everyone to use it. Right now, we are finishing up gathering up input from community. Uh, we're listening to voices, particularly of some underrepresented community members um, and considering their needs in the SDOT decision-making process. In the, um, I'm gonna use the word excitement. I don't know if it felt exciting, but uh, of the closure of the bridge, we um, fell prey to something that, that uh, government that every organization often falls prey to and that is we really listen to the loudest voices. And so we're taking a little bit of a moment to make sure that we're being equitable in our uh, uh, use of the low bridge. So um, we expect to share an update and next steps at the next community task force meeting, which of course you are all welcome to attend. Next slide, please. Right now we're hearing from on-call healthcare providers, people seeking life-saving treatment, uh, West Seattle Business Access, we're um, reevaluating how we do that. Right now we have a pilot program going with the Junction Businesses as well as the West Seattle Chamber. Um, you may know that it costs money to join those organizations. And so um, while we've learned a lot and absolutely appreciate the partnership that Dan Austin and Laura Radford have given us, we really need to make sure that we're offering that business access uh, more equitably to all restaurants and retail that are uh, serving the, the, the peninsula. Um, in addition, we are gathering information about how many people work on Harbor Island and live in West Seattle. Um, we'd like to be able to give access to those folks so that they don't have to drive on the detour route all the way around. It's not so much about their convenience, it's much more about reducing the number of people that are using those detour routes through South Park and Georgetown. Uh, we're also talking to other groups, other essential workers, nonprofits, and community clinics to see um, if we're missing any other um, groups that have particularly pressing needs, but maybe don't have the, um, the know-how or the time to um, hassle us about it. So uh, we, are, we are reaching out to all those folks. Next slide, please. I think we're done. Okay, great. So I just wanted to give you those updates. I know you all have um, lots of spicy questions. So hit me. All right. Thank you very much, Heather. Well, um, as you know, um, we did send uh, some tough, tough things your way. And mm -hmm. you guys, uh, you guys responded with with a couple of things. Um, so and, and folks, as you've got questions, uh, feel free to add them in the chat window, but I'm going to go through a few things uh, that we sent ahead of time. Um, so one, uh, we, we did ask SDOT to compare data of traffic across the lower bridge uh, now versus pre the hybrid closure. Um, and wondering if we were meeting similar capacity or not. Um, and uh, this is a graph that came from SDOT. <laughs> we did not make that. Um, and as you can see there, well, I can let you talk to this, Heather, but it looks to me like we are uh, we are basically balanced out. Is that what I'm looking at? Around 8,300-ish? Yep, uh, yep, that's just right. Um, you'll notice that there were was a significant period of time where we were way above uh, the, the typical capacity of that bridge. Um, where we drop below the line again is, uh, you'll note when we started uh, photo enforcement. And so that has brought the, the level of traffic on the low bridge back down to um, pre-pandemic and pre-closure levels. 
Uh, now, one question I had, in fact, you just repeated the number um, when you were going mm -hmm. through your slides. Um, mm -hmm. So we have heard in the past that the low bridge has a capacity of, you know, up to 20,000 vehicles a day safely. Mm -hmm. Um, this mm -hmm. suggests we're well below that. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about why that is? Is that things yeah. happening either side of the bridge that uh, that impact the no. amount of the flow or no. what's going on there? Uh, I, I think, and Mark, I'm sure we'll have uh, an opinion about how I say this, but um, uh, 20, um, it's not 20,000 comfortably, smoothly free flow traffic. So you know those days when um, the, the high bridge is really backed up and so a lot of people decide to use the low bridge, you know how, how it gets stacked up all the way to Avalon, maybe all the way up Avalon. That's, that's what 20,000 looks like. So um, in our current uh, scenario, I don't, uh, think that anybody thinks that having traffic back up to the junction and um, and all the way back to I-5 is a good idea. Um, I will say that we are, um, as I as I just mentioned, um, we have some additional capacity on the, the low bridge now because uh, Terminal 5 is closed. And so one of the things that we're looking at is how we can open up access to the bridge until Terminal 5 opens again. Um, and those folks that I, I listed uh, in my slides are the, the people that we're, we're working with. Did right, that answer your question? You. Um, I think so, or I trust people will drop more things into the chat. Um, mm -hmm. we, do, we do have some other questions. So okay. um, we, we did ask, uh, you know, many stakeholders in Seattle were not thrilled by the recent publicity that Seattle, City of Seattle vehicles vastly exceeded limits for crossing the lower bridge. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we suspected possibly that that might have been some flimsy reporting on the part of some non-West Seattle media sources. Mm -hmm. um, Bingo. And, and as folks can see, the response we got back was that, yes, yeah, some of that reporting was inaccurate. So, mm -hmm. so you guys are telling us that, that that literally just counted every single government vehicle, no matter what it was and what level it was? Yep. Every government vehicle. So it counted all the buses, uh, which is a lot. Um, every federal vehicle, every state vehicle, every county vehicle uh, got counted. You know, they have special license plates. And so we just counted all those up into a, a big uh, bucket. But when you, when you look into it, um, we, we, uh, we actually did find that there were some numbers that were a little bit uh, not hugely higher, but a little bit higher than what we would have expected out of, um, out of the city. And a lot of that, it turns out, was um, vehicles hauling materials to the Delridge job. And so we've talked with the project manager there to see if we could um, uh, manage those deliveries a little bit more appropriately. That's but that's what data is, yeah, that's what data is really good for is it shows us like, oh, okay, well, where is the problem? And that's um, also the benefit of photo enforcement is we, we know who's crossing the bridge. All right, thank you. Um, question three was, uh, we asked, has SDOT compiled data on average speeds on West Marginal Way um, since the lowered speed limits? Uh, oh, it looks like I may have cut some things off there. Um, <laughs> and uh, I apologize to folks if you can't see um, I don't know how big this is on some people's screens. Um, this is again slide that, as you see, came from SDOT um, about some of the results of traffic calming. Um, I still have some concerns with this, Heather. Uh, you know, I, I see here you're showing us how you know the lower speed limit signs have reduced speeds by one to two percent. Uh, that feedback signs are reducing speeds by four to eleven percent, um, and slower southbounds speeds, but when I look at your actual graphs that you guys shared, mm -hmm. I still have the concern that while I see those going down, mm -hmm. um, you know, going from 44 miles an hour to 39 out miles an hour southbound doesn't seem to me 
like a huge decrease. And in particular, our concern is that, you know, if the median speed was 44 miles before an hour before, that's only four miles above what the posted speed limit was. Whereas now, according to the graph that you sent us, the median speed is 39, but that's 39.32. I can't read close enough. Um, that's nearly 10 miles over the posted speed limit now, mm -hmm. which to me doesn't seem very reflective of safety on the roadway, particularly for all the folks who wanna to choose to drive at that 30 miles per hour, who now feel like people are flying past them at much higher and more dangerous speeds than they're driving. Mm -hmm. Is there a question there? I, I, I hear what you're saying. Absolutely noted. I mean, is it enough to just sort of, you know, throw confetti and say, yay, speeds went down when essentially, yeah. as I said, like, I, I think this could be interpreted in many other ways as well. I don't feel like we're throwing confetti, Michael. Um, the speeds on West Marginal Way are too fast. I, I think we can all agree on that. Um, yes. We have, we have made some interventions that have had some, some modest results. Um, and I think, you know, other things that we could do are to neck down the road to just make it physically narrower. Um, that definitely slows traffic down. Um, I mean, I, there's know, a, I know we have some stakeholders who would be in favor of that. Yep. Um, and you, you know, probably I, have some stakeholders that wouldn't, right? That, so, that is true. Um, yeah. So one of the, that's, you know, and I don't think that's a project maybe that we're going to talk about very much tonight, but, you know, that's one of the questions um, lingering around the, um, the bicycle facility. Um, it's a conundrum. Well, let's talk about this. There's a whole lot of text on the screen here, so I apologize. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the basic question we ask, so quite often when SDOT proposes new projects, that mm -hmm. the neighborhood has been very frightened of and worried that it would cause problems. Uh, what we often get told is, well, it's just pain on the ground and it's really mm -hmm. easy to reverse if we need to. Yeah. Um, and so we want to, we want to sort of flip that around on its head and mm -hmm. sort of say, why is there always this seeming resistance on the part of ESTA when there are requests from the neighborhood? Like, let's test things out. Um, is there a way that we can put something in place? Like, let's just test closing that, that, that the, the, where the proposed southbound project is, where we want to go, stop going from one to two back to one to two. Like, why can't we put some barriers or something out there for a couple of weeks that are temporary, monitor it, we can demonstrate to everybody that it's not impacting their commute and then perhaps build community support to move forward with that project, rather than what some of us fear is that it may just be delayed and delayed um, or stopped. Yeah, I, I don't think there's much danger that it will, I, that facility is in, in all likelihood gonna happen. It's just a matter of time. Um, and so, you know, we're working on the recommendation right now. Um, the, what you're talking about already exists, right? The pinch points are already there. And most people only use the, you know, 80% of the traffic uses that, um, that lane already. And so um, this, this, can I, can I, this, this feels, um, this is an interesting idea. This is an interesting idea. Are you are you thinking about like Jersey barriers or, or? That's what, what I think. I don't know. Presumably, engineers mm -hmm. may say there's something much safer. <laughs> like I I don't know what the best thing. That's what I think mm -hmm. of. Is let's just drop some Jersey barriers there. Mm -hmm. I assume that can be done in a few hours, and then it's put in place, and you do some monitoring, and then if it needs to be picked back up, it's picked back up. Um, a, a big, yeah, a big part of the concern that we're hearing, not from commuters so much as from uh, the freight community, um, is that uh, putting the, the protected bike lane in place before the high bridge is back open 
um, is going to create problems for them. And so we're trying to be, um, we're trying to listen to that and factor that into the recommendation. And I guess what I would say is we're going to have a decision about how we're going to move forward on West Marginal Way in the matter of like a couple of months. And so um, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure how much more this experiment could give us, but, you know, we've taken it back. I'm sure that. I mean, you know, it would tell us whether their worries are justified or not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll also call attention to the other example we've mm -hmm. got here. You know, there are a lot of folks who are saying, why don't we just allow motorcycles over the lower bridge? Mm -hmm. You don't have yeah, to worry about the camera enforcement issue. Yeah. A lot of people don't think it would be too many folks. So again, mm -hmm. why can't we simply say there's no policy change, but mm -hmm. pick a couple of days where you essentially say it's an amnesty day and mm -hmm. folks who want to do it, do it. And we're going to test and see what that looks like. So um, that is a thing that we could do. We have chosen not to. Um, we are not going to be changing the policy on motorcycles. So th I, that's just like, we can keep, you can keep asking and I can keep answering that we are not going to change that policy. People get to use the low bridge because of the, um, of the kind of work that they are doing, not because of the kind of vehicle that they are driving. And so um, uh, allowing motorcycles to, for say, use the low bridge for commuting purposes is not concurrent with our policy. So people get to use the low bridge because they are driving or riding transit. They get uh, to use the low bridge if they are um, delivering freight. So it's about the activity, not about the vehicle. And uh, the last question we had here again, I apologize for all the text, but um, you know, we, we, we've, been, we've been pretty picky on you guys for a while now. It's a long running problem we have that it feels like a lot of things are, decisions are made for political reasons. Um, and, and then we talk about data and evidence um, when it really looks like they're, they're made uh, for other reasons. Um, and so again, pointing out at some of the stuff uh, you guys have pointed out, um, you know, in terms of supporting for lo just lowering speed limits. And again, we're not opposed to lowering speed limits when appropriate and on specific roadways. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're concerned about this blanket, like, let's just, let's just lower everything by five miles per hour on all the state-owned roads. Um, you know, your own case studies show that when it was done in several spots in Northeast Seattle, that Things went down sometimes by a couple miles per hour. In one case, just by tenths of a mile per hour. Mm -hmm. um, and again, how you know what is the data we're actually using to rate things? Because this is not traffic engineers do not say just lower speed limits and achieve vision zero, and that increases safety. What they say is lower speed limits and study each roadway in context to determine what's the most appropriate speed limit. And that doesn't seem to be what SDOT's doing. It's much easier for certain folks to just buy signs and then politicians can put out a press release and talk about how much they're doing to improve safety. Mm. And so I will leave that there for folks to, to read or come back in the video and pause. Uh, but that should be the last thing uh, that we have there. Yes. So I will turn it over to Kate to see what questions we have coming from folks for the next five or 10 minutes. All right. Got one question. In the city's effort to go green, why not open the low level bridge to electric vehicles? I think I know the answer. <laughs> so smart. So yeah. smart, Kate. I'm picking up on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I thought that was a great an interesting answer though, the, the category of activity, not the category of vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, would you expect speeds to come down further with time on West Marginal Way? Um, the study afterwards was done pretty quickly after the, the radar signs went in. Mm -hmm. um, hard to say. I, I don't know if I would take it wager. Okay, I, I, I didn't know, know if you'd seen that on other roads in the past. So, 
Um, what is the target level of service on the low bridge? The the number of vehicles that that you know I don't know that number I think like off the top ABCD. of my head. The target level I don't understand level of service. Um, oh, the ABC. like LOS? Yeah. Oh, well I think I think LOS is about um, traffic signals usually. Um, so I will say that we um, expect we, we want to set the, the level of traffic at the um, across the bridge at a level that if we have to open the bridge for marine traffic, um, if it's like uh, if it's a 10 minute opening, then we want to be able to recover, like get the system back to stasis uh, in 20 minutes. So the the recovery time is is double the amount of time that say the bridge is open. That's that's the goal. Um, and, and the reason is that um, as traffic backs up because of a marine opening, it backs all the way up and it messes up other signals all over the place. And so um, we're, that's, I don't know. I mean, they're scientists, but I don't know if it's particularly scientific. I think that's just what they settled on as the standard that they were gonna go for. The, this, this high bridge failure thing is, is you know, we're a year into it, we're still learning. Okay. Why would it be temporary access for people going to the same places that the freight is going, regardless if it's Terminal 5 or Terminal 18? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Andrew, are you willing to? Yeah, I can ask the question. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not sure why it would be, con well, if it gets open to Arbor Island workers that live in West Seattle, uh -huh. why would it be considered temporary for, for, for us when we're going to the same place that the freight is going to? Like we always have been before the closure. Right, um, it's, uh, it's because the, num the amount of traffic that um, is gonna flow into Terminal 5 is way above um, and what we, what we had before. And so it's, you remember, I was just talking about that 10 minute, 20 minute thing. No, so, I know. I've, yeah. I see it so all you're, the time. Yeah. I, yeah. Like, like every Monday morning, um, every all day. the way back to I-5. Yep. <laughs> um, and so that's gate management. We can talk about that on a different day. Um, but uh, I, I think what we need to see is, and because we don't know, the, the businesses that, that operate on Harbor Island haven't shared with us yet how many people live in West Seattle and work on Harbor Island. We just don't know. Yeah. Um, and so if it's like 10 of you guys, then probably we don't have to roll that back. But if it's like a thousand, then that's a whole different kettle of fish and we just don't know. So well, we're waiting so for your, we're waiting for your employers to get back to us with that number. No. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. Uh, I understand mm -hmm. that part. Um, but also the way it gets backed up on the east side of Harbor Island with all the freight coming into Terminal 18. Yep. Um, my concern is that once Terminal 5 opens, you're going to have that same backup mm -hmm. on the low bridge trying to yeah. exit yep. the east side of Harbor Island. And that's, yep. where, that's where the majority of the regular Harbor Island workers yep. exit. Yep. Uh, now, you're familiar with that, that first exit on the low bridge that goes around onto Harbor Island, correct? Uh, which which direction are you headed? Still, are you headed still, westbound? If you're coming from West Seattle and you go over uh -huh. the low bridge, that mm -hmm. first exit down there yep. that goes up to Click Katat Avenue and Click Tat yes. Way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that was the route that I always took to get to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we, mm -hmm. I never used the West Seattle Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't it make more sense to have the people that live in West Seattle take that route just like they always have instead of further backing up traffic that's trying to exit the east side of Harbor well, Island? Right. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. We're finding out the number of people okay. in your situation so that we can evaluate whether or not there's space on the bridge for you to use that that route, for you to use the low bridge to get to Harbor Island. We're, we're working on it like right now. Okay. Yeah, no, I know. I know. And I appreciate that. I, I do. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, Heather, this is Deb Barker. I just want to clarify. There's still then 
employers and others who are sitting on your requests for information? Yes. And if that's true, uh, how can... Um, you can't. I know. Can <laughs> verbal help? Um, that's, I'm frustrated for you and for all of us with, with hearing about that. Oh, Deb. <laughs> the number of my frustrations are our legion. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're actually working through the port uh, quite a lot. Um, the, yeah. the port is the, the um, leaseholder for yeah. all those businesses. And so they're really in the best position to um, s squeeze the information out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we're working closely with them. Off the if top I line. thought council member, if I thought council member Herbold or council member McDermott could help, believe me, they would be okay. on the list. Just saying, because we asked um, mm -hmm. uh, Metro how we could help. Is there any way we could, you know, I'm seeing yeah. people standing out and do surveys. Where do you live? <laughs> You're coming out of this building. Where do you live? Yeah. Something like that. Uh, thinking outside the box. So totally. I out. totally appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Deb. Is there a reason we have to put that extra work on the businesses at all? Um, why couldn't we simply invite people who believe they're eligible to send you information? I mean, I would assume, uh, like we had Andrew here, I would assume Andrew would be able to show you a pay stub or something that shows <laughs> where he works and then something that shows that he has an electric bill or something at a residence here. And therefore, you know, it, 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 like that seems like something we should take on at the city rather than pushing on to the small businesses that are there. Well, Michael, if City Light would like to take on that task, I'm happy to assign it to you. Um, we, uh, there's a lot of work happening on the West Seattle Bridge. And uh, this is um, a benefit. There's a lot of work happening. And this is a benefit for, uh, for employees of, of, uh, of folks who, of businesses that uh, operate on Harbor Island. So I hope, um, Andrew, that you are encouraging your employer, don't tell me who it is, uh, <laughs> to share the information. We, you know, we need businesses to be in partnership with us. And so, um, there is an expectation that businesses are going to share information with us. Yeah, I don't I don't think a lot of the people that that are in my same position are kind of up to date on all the policies and right are very and that's why. Right. Yeah, and they're that's not why, very in, into this whole this yeah. whole thing. They don't know where to go to find the meetings. They don't know the the new updates mm -hmm. and all that type of stuff. The, so the I, I often are. have to. Tell. Yeah, the businesses are. Yeah, but we're not hearing anything about it through emails or anything i had to reach out to find out that information yeah. well these are good questions to ask your your employer no i know yeah i yeah. i get it i get it um reaching out to people is really difficult and i don't know about you guys but the number of emails that i get on my personal email like it, and most of them are not interesting, right? Most of them are not relevant to, oh, hey, Banana Republic is having another sale, right? So um, I think it's easy as you're going through and cleaning out your home email inbox to just delete stuff and, and move through it. I think you have to really want to engage um, on the issue. It's, yeah. it's tough, it's tough. We can, only, we can only share the information. We can't know it for people, you know? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a quick question for the Puget Sound pilots? Um, a lot of them have to go around, and it seems like there ought to be a blanket, uh, a blanket pass through for them because all of their work is either on Harbor Island or mm -hmm. on the piers north of Harbor Island. And and mm -hmm. to ask whoever are the this the pilots living in West Seattle to drive all the way down to the First Avenue Bridge and all, and come mm -hmm. back it doesn't make much sense. Uh, yeah. one, of pilot, one of the pilots I know was driving a friend's car mm -hmm. and he couldn't come from Pier 34, I think it's T34, mm -hmm. across the bridge because even though he had a, a pass, mm -hmm. 
The car didn't have the pass and he was afraid that he'd get his pilot friend in trouble if he drove the pilot friend's car back to West Seattle. So there ought to be just a blanket. I mean, again, who you work for is, you said, is, is the key. So uh, mm -hmm. if the people doing the maritime work, um, the people doing the maritime work should be the ones that should, should have priority on the bridge too. Um, so that's that piece. My second question is about the heavy buses, the, ra the rapid ride buses. Part of SDOT's uh, rationale uh, around the problem with the high bridge was that they added too much weight. Uh, that, that, that adding the extra weight from 50 or 60,000 pound buses. That was an, yeah, was an, that was an early hypothesis, Martin. Mm -hmm. um, what, we've, what we've figured out, what we've learned is that the standards for post-tensioning a structure like that, um, seg concrete segmental box girder bridge, um, mm -hmm. at the time, um, the post-tensioning uh, that was required by the code was insufficient. So um, that's, that's why what we're doing to fix it is adding additional post-tensioning. So it wasn't a question of, of the buses. The buses were always there, right? Yeah. Um, it was a question of, of a design. I don't want to call it a design flaw because it was absolutely to the code of the day, but the code of the day wasn't good enough. Yeah. Okay. So I was, I was worrying about putting the heavy buses on the low bridge. Now you're saying I don't have to worry about that. Don't worry about that. Yay. <laughs> Take it off the list. You, you got plenty to worry about. Thanks. All right. Do we have one more question in the, in the chat there to read, Kate, or are we good? Um, let's see. I could do one more. I think that'll cover it. All right. um, has the high bridge failure caused SDOT to ensure that there are catastrophe contingencies for all major roadways now with immediate follow failover plans um, ready? Or would a similar failure in 10 years be just as disrupted and unexpected? I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but let me give it a shot. Uh, in, in the past year, uh, no, we have not made catastrophe contingencies for all major roadways in the city. Um, I can tell you that we have uh, detour plans uh, that exist for all the bridges. We didn't have to make up the detour for the West Seattle Bridge um, from whole cloth. We knew exactly where the detours would go. And so we have those detours and traffic control plans for all the bridges um, and for all of our major arterials. Um, the unexpected part of this was that cracks in the bridge that at first looked like absolutely expected concrete creep uh, started to grow a matter, you know, feet in a matter of days. And we were worried uh, that the bridge was going to collapse. And so that's, that's why we closed the bridge. Um, and that, that is a function of the way that the structure behaved. It was, you're right, it was unexpected. It was not due to maintenance failure. Um, it was due to the particular level of design and, and code required uh, post-tensioning when we built the bridge. Is that an hey. answer? I'm not yes, sure I understood I so. the question, so. I think okay. you got it. All right, okay. thank you, Michael. Well, as always, thank you very much for being with us, Heather, particularly tonight with lots of, uh, lots of questions being tossed at you. Um, before, I mean, wrapping up this, um, you know, our, our, our ad slide, if you will. Um, so I pulled this graphic off the SDOT blog um, mm -hmm. that recently celebrated the, well, I guess we're not celebrating, recognized the one year anniversary <laughs> of the bridge closure um, yeah. and uh, very specifically acknowledge the hardships that are being done throughout West Seattle and Duwamish Valley communities. Yeah. Um, and then I want to, I did some very quick editing on the fly at the start of the meeting um, 
because we want to make sure folks know um, one of their latest blog posts. Um, so if you're not aware and haven't been paying attention to our discussions, in November, the Seattle City Council authorized an increase of the current $20 vehicle license fee to $40 as part of the Seattle Transportation Benefit District. Uh, we, in this case, is SDOT. SDOT is in the process of developing a spending plan for this additional funding. Um, and as part of their efforts, they've been gathering input. And so they really want everybody to go to this SurveyMonkey address and fill out and give feedback um, about uh, what should be proposed for that increase. And the due date is 9 a.m. on March 30th. So please, if you are in here right now, uh, jot that down or come back and look at this uh, video feed later um, or check out the SDOT blog. I, I'm sure I'll post that to Facebook probably sometime tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, keep an eye out and give them their feedback. Um, let's thank uh, Heather and Madison for being with us. And uh, we are not done yet with our meeting. Um, we do have a few more things to wrap up. Um, I realize we are past eight o'clock, but don't worry. I do plan for us to be um, adjourned by 8.30. Um, Michael, I'm gonna excuse myself. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, yes, please. I'm sure it's been a long work day. <laughs> yes, it has indeed. At least Thanks, you don't have to commute home over the bridge. That's true. I'm right here at home where I always am. Yeah. Stagger out the door. All right. Um, I do want to have a brief conversation this evening um, about recruiting board members. Um, we do have at least one person in the uh, in attendance right now, I think, or or is he gone? Um, uh, we might have others, um, but we, we've had several folks expressing interest, which is awesome. Um, and so I thought we might have sort of a general conversation. Uh, folks who are interested are welcome to um, identify themselves and ask any questions you may have. Um, but uh, I'm looking for a more general either, you know, raise your hand or, or drop into the chat. Um, you know, if we, we've got like three or four people who've already expressed interest um, to some of the publicity we've put out there about it. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering just general membership, how, how would you like us to vet people? Do, are there specific things uh, that you think? Uh, our board has chatted a little bit about what qualities are we lacking on the board? What expertise, <laughs> what demographics? Um, what points of view, um, but we want to hear from you. Maybe you have some things, ideas that we haven't considered. Can everybody speak at once? Yeah, Michael, I'm, I'm not even sure I understand your question. <laughs> I think my preference is if we can get a high school kid that's uh, interested in transportation to uh, become a board member like we had before. It'd be good for their resume and it'd be good for, for us to get uh, this perspective of a young person. All right. Or, I mean, I or... think, you know, there, there's no requirement that we have a full board. The number of positions we have identified was really sort of established by really the number of founding board members we had years ago. Um, so I think we technically have three or even four positions vacant. So we could very easily, if we've got four people who are interested, we could certainly welcome all four. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like I said, Deb, I think the question is, you know, is there some sort of vetting type of questions that we should ask? individuals who are interested or when well, we Jeremy B has them. a question. Did you see that? Um, Where does one apply? I didn't see a way to do so on the website. So we don't have an application of any sort. Um, we put out a we put out a press release. I know the blog um, mentioned it. Um, and we, we sent it around to a few other sort of community places. Um, and so a few people clearly have seen it because I've been getting the, 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 mm -hmm. in a, we have a, I'll type here in the chat. We have a, we have a general address info at 
westseattletc.org. Um, and so uh, I've had a few people reach out. A um, couple of people who said, I'm really interested, but I'm already booked uh, this Thursday and I won't be able to be there in person, but I'll check out the video. Um, as I said, I, I saw one person earlier, um, but maybe he couldn't stay the whole time. Um, so yeah, I mean, do people think we should put together some sort of list of questions that we ask people to we answer? Could. We, and maybe our bylaws cover uh, potential board uh, applications. You know, if you want to come, if you want to put yourself out as a as a potential board member, you have to attend a certain number of meetings, and then declare that you want to be a board member at the I think the April meeting or the May meeting, mm -hmm. and then uh, we take the vote. Uh, so to me, the, the criteria, the, the key criteria for anybody on, a, on the board is a, an almost wonky uh, interest in transportation issues on the peninsula. Hey, come on. Hey, fine. I resemble that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> interest in transportation issues, interest in, in neighbor, in uh, community uh, welfare issues. Um, and um, and a commitment to show up. Uh, yeah, it's super easy. It it's, it, you don't have to be a track. You don't even have to like traffic. You can. Yeah, I guess you don't. <laughs> well, I, I think too, to, to Martin's point there that the uh, I mean, April uh, assumes that we have contested positions, uh, you know, right now with, with vacancies. I mean, theoretically, yeah. it wouldn't be a matter of, of you know, holding things over until April. It would be, you know, I guess show up for a few meetings Mm -hmm. express some sort of interest uh you know i, I guess yeah. you know from my perspective you know kind of convince us that you're interested in the organization and and you know you want to be a part of the organization and and given our uh chronic uh, openings that we've been, we've been carrying for a while i mean the the transition from from that point to actual board membership was probably going to be very seamless mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and I, I like the process that i went through when uh when I wanted to join, um, we were doing the public meetings. Um, I was asked to kind of give up, get up and give a little speech about who I am and why I was interested and in kind yeah. of I, my uh, knowing that it would be voted on to say, yeah, yeah. you've got a board position. So I, I like that. I like the little bit of the pressure, just having somebody just explain to everybody why they want to be on it. Mm -hmm. They are, et cetera. It's not yeah. much to ask. Yeah. I. I, I I, it's probably not surprising, but I do think it's sort of funny that clearly um, our, our mission and the things that we present are of interest um, because we had healthy participation earlier in the meeting. Um, mm -hmm. you know, certainly at the level of, of many other neighborhood groups, in fact, better than some neighborhood meetings that I've seen. And then as soon as we transition to let's discuss board membership, half of the people who were in attendance signed off. Snore. But at the same time, the, the, the folks that we uh, had as guests and the topics, they wouldn't be happening if this board yeah. hadn't said, what's important to this community? What do we, what do we need to hear about? What do we care about? What do we want to know about? So. All right. Well, I will let all the folks who've been uh, sending in their interest um, you know, Michael, Michael, this is Jason Grosh. I'm not sure if my unmute is working. Uh, we can hear you. Okay, good. I just want to, I'm not sure if I was the person you were referring to that expressed interest. You and I traded messages earlier this week. So. Um, yes, um, actually, I suppose actually uh, there were two of you because I also saw uh, Tarek who was there briefly. Uh, okay. I didn't leave. I'm, st I'm still here. Oh, yeah. good. Um, I, I think, I think one of the things also, pardon, pardon, uh, uh, to sort of Larry's point though, I guess with our, with our current uh, sort of, process we end up with a very homogenous board as well so that's mm -hmm. sort of the downside of, of continuing with the same uh, induction process is it it sort of has be, it hasn't begot a lot of diversity yeah we we reach out to um neighborhoods all over the peninsula and for whatever reason we're not getting we're not getting membership from Highland Park, from South Park, from. Uh, um, and you did circulate it to the D D1CN list, right, Larry? 
I have. Um, I'm going to be sending um, some stuff out here next week and plan on having that be part of that. I cannot remember what I've had in the past, right. but yeah, yeah, I'm about to do a big, a big uh, email. Here with Maybe that. you or Deb or. Oh no, I've already planned on having this be one okay. of the topics. Perfect. Yeah. Um, because yeah. I mean, I would, I would love to have someone from South Park or, you know, that that would be Island Park even. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. South Park is technically off the peninsula, but as we're all well aware, all of our traffic is going right through or past them right now. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they're intimately familiar with the same issues that we wrestle with here, so. Who, uh, what, what area besides South Park? Cause I'm also going to be doing, you know, I'm also working on uh, uh, Westwood Highland Park. Let me get I, I, yeah, I mean, um, Westwood I'm Highland right. Park, Roxbury is, right. you know. The Wyra. They're one of the most active neighborhood groups over here on the peninsula right now. Um, well, and so it would be great if they wanted to send a representative to yeah. us. Island Park and South Park. Yeah. Who, anybody else? Uh, the reason I'm say, asking is because I'm going to be doing uh, dedicated outreaches to each neighborhood, somebody in each neighborhood to try to obtain questions for these um, the, the forums that we're putting together for the uh, the upcoming elections, so I can also kind of add this and whoever I'm reaching out to to add this one mm -hmm. in. Um, is if there... it's not you, can do you have anybody within within your neighborhood that you know might like to be uh, involved in, with us? You know, folks <laughs> asked about the college there in the chat. Um, we've occasionally kind of had some interest from the college in the past. Um, a lot of concern about their students coming by bus. A lot of concern with things happening to the 125 and the 128. Um, presumably some of that concern may have sort of died down for a little bit here as most of their students aren't actually commuting to yeah. campus. Um, but that is certainly something to reach out to again, well, whether actually, a student wants to join or whether one of their staff wants to join. I just emailed the Dean of the college this week. Okay. And he's going to, uh, uh, reach out to folks on his side. So I'll follow up with them in a week or two. We have some interest from uh, like, I don't know what their, what their student council or whatever their, their representative yeah. or student uh, organization. We've, we've, we've had some- Matt Witt or Matt Ritt, some, something like that. And also, and the woman who, who came has left the college. So uh, it's a new, mm -hmm. uh, it'd be a new crew uh, who, who we'd be connecting with. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I will. I will invite uh, the folks who have expressed interest to attend our April meeting. Yeah, April meeting, um, and be prepared to share some uh, introductory thoughts on uh, why they're interested in joining the board. Marcy had a good point about uh, reaching out to the Duwamish tribe. I know that Jolene's pretty stretched, pretty thin, but uh, we, yeah. She, she may have some other folks uh, who work with her. Yeah, we, re we reached out to them back when we were in, in steady conversation with them about mm -hmm. the, uh, about the West, uh, about West Marginal Way. Um, yes, and I'm trying okay. to picture. And there's a, the, um, the gentleman who was doing a whole lot of outreach for them mm -hmm. around the, the light Ford. project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Perkins. Dr. Perkins, Perkins yeah. thank you. Yeah. I knew it was Dr. Something. Okay. <laughs> and he was up to his yep. ears and everything. So yep. <laughs> and we haven't heard back from him. So yeah. All right. Okay. Well, I will keep us. Good idea though, Marcy. Thank you. Moving yeah. here. Well, we lost a lot of participants, but but uh, uh, out of transparency. Um, I will point out uh, so uh Heather mentioned earlier about the uh, infra letter uh, that went out in support of uh, the request that uh, they made mm -hmm. for uh, funding for the West Seattle Bridge. Um, they uh, received letters from a number of community groups yeah. um, in support of that. And uh, we also submitted a letter and folks can go to that s.blog there from March 23rd. Uh, there is actually a link and you can read through all the different community letters uh, that were submitted if that's mm -hmm. of interest. Um, also wanna let folks know that we, uh, we have established a bank account. Actually, we've almost established it. 
I, I'm behind in getting some documentation uh, signed. I need to go ahead and right. do that. Um, but uh, but that thanks to Larry, um, applause. Um, and so uh, just letting folks know about that, we can start to. Uh, and so with that, funding for things. Eligible people, eligible signatures would be then who? Just for clarification. Um, oh yes. So the the signers will be Larry as treasurer and myself as chair for the moment, right. so that we Thank have you. at least at least two signers. Okay. Uh, well, they've already got mine. I'm already on board. We're, we're waiting for Michael right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd say we should put some sort of financial, you know, uh, um, policies in yeah. place. But seeing as how we we're we're not looking at having thousands of dollars anytime soon, we could probably hold off on that. Um, and then, uh, right on time here, I'll roll us into new business, which is. Uh, if folks uh, have any ideas or maybe one of the new board members that we recruit. Um, so we do have nonprofit status here in Washington state. Um, and we've been, I've been funding fi filing that report uh, for the last couple of years, um, but we do not have IRS nonprofit tax status. So that's sort of the next step now. So um, if we wanted to actually start soliciting donations of some sort, or encouraging people to, um, you know, make membership donations, and we wanted those to be tax deductible. Um, that would be the next step: is to um, apply for, um, presumably, 501c3 status. There are some other status options in terms of lobbying and other things that we might want to consider. Wouldn't wouldn't um, we be more of like a 501c4? Because I don't know. I I mean I yeah. don't know that we really qualify for a charitable organization, do we? Um, the the C three guidelines are very broad. Yeah. Um, the C four is very specific, mm -hmm. um, and that is that is generally anyone doing political stuff. Uh, a lot, actually, a lot of major uh, groups that you're aware of um, actually have a C three and C four arm and sort of direct funds between the two, um, because as a C three, you cannot do specific lobbying, you cannot run specific campaigns and things. And so we may wanna have a conversation about that. Um, C4s are generally speaking, not tax deductible for folks to donate to. Um, I'm not sure that we engage really in campaigning. Like tonight, talking with an elected official or letting, encouraging people to provide feedback to a, an elected official is not campaigning or lobbying. It would be us specifically going in as the WSTC and specifically urging Council Member McDermott to vote on some King County ordinance mm -hmm. in a way that we want him to. Um, so I'm pretty confident um, but we may want some people to do more research on that or people who've done yeah. it before to give us well, some guidance. I, I, so I guess, it, is, is, it, is it worth the headache? I mean, are, are people really going to start donating to us all of a sudden because we, you know, they can deduct the, I mean, it just, no, it's it just, not. It, it just yeah. seems like the return on our, our energy that we need to spend to make that happen, you know, wouldn't necessarily be worth it. Well, I've always looked look at this as being more low key. If we're looking to get more donations, well, what's the purpose? What are the things that we're wanting to do where we need yeah. these outside of just general operating expenses? Do we I mean, I some, think we have some big, big things that we'd like to do. The two things that come to my mind from our neighborhood group perspective, um, one is, do we think people are more or less willing to give to us based on whether they can deduct it from their taxes. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe we can, you know, maybe that's something for us to think about. Um, maybe we don't see that as a disincentive for that. Uh, and then the second thing is generally speaking, if we wanna pursue grants from say the city or a local foundation, typically they will only make grants to 501c3s. Well, what do we want to do? So with if money, we don't Michael? want to pursue that status, then we have to look at uh, fiscal sponsorship, which again is not an unusual thing for a number of neighborhood groups here in West Seattle to do. 
Um, I believe Larry Admiral is a fiscal sponsor for several groups, aren't they? Yes, um, we have been, yeah. Yeah. So but what do we want to do? That's certainly not a barrier, but it, that's the other one that comes to mind. Yeah, we're getting to be 8.30 now. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to answer this question on the IRS. Nope, we can talk about it more at the board meeting, next okay. board meeting, but I wanted to bring it up. Probably a good time. Um, yeah. As far as uh, guests coming up, um, can, are we moving on quick? Um, yes, we can wrap okay. up now. So we yeah. do have a Northwest Seaport Alliance at our April meeting. Yeah, and uh, for me, I'd like to get Gonzalez in here um, and or both of the, I'm trying to get Peterson. So I'm waiting to hear back mm -hmm. from Toby Thaler. Um, and I'd like to get the, the two at-large uh, representatives <clears throat> who uh, uh, would like to ask a number of questions of, about transportation. Gonzalez, uh, particularly why, uh, uh, why she hijacked the, uh, uh, the SDOT maintenance money and uh, as that bridge maintenance. Bridge, bridge maintenance money, yeah. Would you like to reach out to her as vice chair and invite her to come to the meeting? I, I love it when you call me vice chair. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I don't know. Being on a Zoom meeting for a long time gets me very tired. I think we're, I, yeah. I'll move to adjourn. No, I'm not I see uh, Deb has two quick things to mention, and I don't have anything else. So, yeah. Two quick new business items. Sound Transit staff is going to be at the Avalon Neighborhood meeting on Monday night, uh, the 29th at 7 p.m. Uh, ping me if you want that Zoom uh, address, whatever the hell it's called. Michael, okay. Um, and I'm thinking that the topic uh, for them is this realignment issue that Sound Transit Board is getting to chew on all by themselves with no public input. So, um, yeah. <laughs> And other uh, How did that happen? what? How did that happen? I don't. <clears throat> I can't really say. Uh, other real quick news is the Stone Cottage uh, at 1123 Harbor Avenue will be saved. Will be moving to Port of Seattle storage sometime. We're hoping maybe in April. Stay tuned. Well done. Um, it'll be rolling down the, the street fairly quickly in, in the middle of the night. And uh, y'all are welcome. All right. Thank you. So, Mark, I guess you have a motion to make. Yeah. Anyone <laughs> second? I second. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, we will be ending the recording Thanks and the everybody. Facebook live stream. Thank you for everyone for joining well, us this month. Good meeting. Thank you. And uh, we'll see everybody Thanks, in a few weeks. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye. Bye.